All right. Good morning, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. How are we doing on sound, Peter? Good? Awesome. Great. Uh, well, welcome, everyone, this morning to our fifth and final summer prevention webinar uh, in our summer series. Um, my name is Jesse Corcoran. I'm the prevention coordinator at WACASA. And um, this is our second uh, webinar series that we've done uh, regarding prevention uh, in the summer. And we do organize it in the summer purposefully to hopefully accommodate prevention educator schedules. We know that y'all can be very busy during the school time. Um, but if you have feedback about this series or ideas for future topics, please email me. My email is right there. It's jessec at wakasa.org. Um, please let me know if you have other ideas for future topics. We really want to make this as useful and as helpful to you as possible. Um, just a quick note. Uh, these are all of the topics that we had already in our series, gender socialization, anti-oppression, male engagement, um, and last week was a webinar on pornography, normalizing the relationship between violence and sex. Um, and Amber actually talked a lot in that webinar about um, still being a sex-positive feminist uh, while doing this work, and I think that that really leads in really well to today's webinar about teaching good sex a method for violence prevention. So um, this is a presentation that I watched uh, Meg Foster from the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force give at NSAC in June in Dallas. Um, and I was really, really excited about it. I thought it was awesome. Um, and I said, please, Meg, turn this into a webinar for us. And she really uh, was willing to do that for us. So I'm really, really excited to, to turn it over to her in just a few moments. Um, before I do, I just want to go over a couple of things, especially for those of you who may be new to our technology. Um, just so you know, after this webinar, um, we will provide any sort of handouts or resources that were discussed during the webinar, um, the slides, and a webinar recording. Uh, all of those things will be emailed to you. Um, during the webinar, please feel free to use the questions box to ask any questions. Um, I throughout the webinar as well. So um, we will he be here monitoring what questions are rolling in as the presentation is going. And um, when we get a moment, we will sort of interject ourselves and ask Meg your question. So um, if you're having things that are coming up as the presentation goes along, please feel free to submit those. Um, but please know that we will have about a 15-minute Q&A at the end of the webinar as well. So you can ask questions then as well. Um, if you're having any technological difficulty, please use either the chat or the question box to let us know. Um, and then also, I believe that Meg has some questions for you during her presentation as well. So she's going to ask for some feedback from the audience. Um, if you have a chat box, you can type them in there. I know sometimes the technology isn't working quite right, so you can also provide those answers in the questions box, which I know sounds a little bit silly. Um, but wherever you can communicate with us, we'll make sure that your answers to Meg's questions get, get read and um, are, are known to her as well. Um, so without too much further ado, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Meg. Let's see here. All right, awesome. Meg, are you with us? I am. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name, as Jesse mentioned, is Meg Foster. Uh, I'm the Prevention Program Coordinator at an organization called the Oregon Attorney General Sexual Assault Task Force. Kind of a mouthful, so we usually just say Sexual Assault Task Force. Um, this is me in case you are curious what I look like. Um, and we work across the state of Oregon. So we provide training and technical assistance for folks who work in sexual violence response and sexual violence for prevention. We're a little bit weird as an organization because um, we also here in Oregon have our coalition that does a lot of statewide work. Um, and so we are also this other organization. Um, we are a multidisciplinary organization, and so we convene a multidisciplinary group of um, an advisory body that is made up of everyone from offender management to legislative and public policy and prevention and education. And we're all in the same room um, several times a year and having conversations that are critical to moving sexual violence forward. Um, 
I think that sounds really great, um, but it's not as easy as I feel like I just made it sound. So <laughs> it's definitely a complicated um, process of, of building shared language and getting everyone together. Um, but I'm our prevention program coordinator, so I work with folks like you uh, here in Oregon to develop best practice that's reflective of our state to support people in engaging in primary prevention, in um, building practice around healthy sexuality and sexual violence prevention. I'm definitely intrigued by your presentation you did last week on pornography because we've been having a lot of conversations about that as well and supporting folks in, in teaching about it and responding to it in their classroom. So um, a lot of similar conversations, it seems. So that's kind of what we do in a, in a nutshell. Uh, I always start here when I present um, that sexual violence is preventable and everyone has a role and a responsibility in preventing it. I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is about finding shared language with folks. Uh, I know when I talked to Jessie about this, she mentioned that sometimes getting buy-in for healthy sexuality or sexual health promotion can be challenging. And I think a key part of that is finding shared language. And so finding what our roles and what our responsibilities are, recognizing that they're not the same for everyone um, and oftentimes aren't the same as anyone. So we each have a very unique role in addressing sexual violence and working to prevent it. Um, so I start all my slides here. I think a lot of folks don't even recognize that sexual violence is preventable, so I think it's important to set that tone throughout the whole presentation. I also just wanted to touch on, as I understand it, most of you are preventionists um, or engaged in prevention somehow, but I also just wanted to touch on where we kind of center our prevention work, which is working upstream, um, doing primary prevention, addressing the root causes of sexual violence, um, but I always say it's not enough to tell people what not to do. We also have to replace that with what we want them to do. So that's where this presentation kind of comes in. So starting with what is healthy sexuality, we're going to try um, asking you all this question and see what you come up with real quick. So um, if you could go ahead and enter any thoughts you have in the questions box or the chat box, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on healthy sexuality. I'll give you uh, like 30 seconds to, uh, to write something. See if anything comes in. I see, I see someone says respect. Absolutely, I think that's definitely a key part of healthy sexuality. Acknowledges the importance of pleasure, mutuality, and agency. I love that. I love that you're talking about pleasure. That's really awesome. Mutual consent, respect, mutual pleasure. I love that you're talking about multiple people, that it's not just one person's consent, respect, and pleasure. The CERTS model, that's something that a lot of our programs use here in, in Oregon as well. Um, I just totally forgot what the E stands for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so CERTS is a great model that I've seen a lot. Um, openness with your partner and yourself, being comfortable with yourself and your partner. This can also increase chances of comfortability with healthcare providers as well. I love that you're drawing connections between individual and relational levels um, of how we interact and engage with the world. I think that's awesome. Um, uh, thank you for spelling out certs. I can't believe I forgot mm -hmm. equality. <laughs> um, yeah, so consent, equality, respect, trust, and safety. I appreciate that. Yeah, Let's see. Um, communication, that is totally huge. Knowing your body and feeling safe expressing yourself. Consensual, feeling comfortable with your partner. Awesome. I'm seeing a lot about consent, which is awesome because I'm going to talk a little bit about consent today. Um, let's see if there are any others. Great. I mean, I think that's a great example um, of healthy sexuality. And just to throw a little hitch in your answers, I want to talk about healthy sexuality using what is called the sexuality tree. 
I'm not sure if folks are familiar with this, um, but it is available. It's a free resource online, and so um, it is available for folks if you want to um, check it out. But the creators of the sexuality, sexuality describe healthy sexuality as being experienced and influenced on three different levels. One is the intimate level, uh, the next is the relational level, and the next is the cultural level. So um, the intimate level are things we experience personally, this can, or things that we value personally, this can grow and change over time. Um, we know that sexuality is expressed and experienced differently throughout our lives. Relational is how we learn about sex and sexuality from the people in our lives, as well as how we express our sex and sexuality with people in our lives. And then culture is kind of that broader how we experience sex and sexuality on this cultural level. Um, they talk about how this is deeply rooted, and it can be changed, but this is more difficult to change. This is where we start talking about those social norms about sex and sexuality. So what they do is they give us this beautiful tree here with intimate at the, with the leaves, um, relational, uh, is the trunk there, and cultural are the roots. And then they give us this long, lengthy list here and ask us to categorize these with how we experience and are influenced by these things. So, um, and it, each one doesn't have to go in just one category. It can go in lots of different categories. But I want to give you just a minute to look through this list and think about how you might categorize. You don't have to share with us, but just look through the list and see what's on there um, and if there's anything missing. Think about how you might categorize healthy sexuality for you. And again, this is how you experience and are also influenced by these things. So I remember um, when I did this presentation in Texas, someone asked what, for example, skin hunger was. Um, and I was really appreciative that there was someone else in the audience who felt comfortable answering that question because I think it was a really good example of the ways in which we might define these um, and experience these terms differently. Um, and so the definition, I don't remember what they shared, but um, the definition they shared reminded me about uh, an experience I had living overseas and how I didn't have a lot of healthy consensual touch. It was a lot of sitting in really tight spaces and um, people touching my hair or other things like that. Um, and so this idea of wanting this positive, healthy, consensual touch, um, I totally resonated with skin hunger in a way I didn't ever think about it before. So I think the idea is that we experience all of these differently. And another one that really came up in Texas was folks talking about um, the fact that things like abortion or rape are on here. Um, and I think a key part of this is acknowledging, of course, that there are always survivors um, in the room or in the various rooms that we are currently in, um, but also that I think specifically culturally, there are a lot of ways that, and relationally, there are a lot of things that we learn about those and are told about those things. And so all of these pieces play a role in how we understand healthy sexuality. And all of this is to say that we all experience sexuality differently. So I think a lot of times people are looking for a strict definition of healthy sexuality, which is really problematic if you're looking to promote healthy sexuality because it does look different for folks. And recognizing that there are lots of different influences and lots of different pieces that inform how we experience and understand sexuality is a critical part of being able to promote it as well. You can see there's pornography on here as well. It sounds like you all spent some time learning about pornography last week. Um, so 
very interesting and I think holding these pieces and the sexuality in mind um, when you're talking about sexuality is a really valuable tool. I highly recommend, um, I, I think Jesse sent out the link there, um, but if you Google sexuality as well, it'll show up. But you, I highly recommend going and maybe printing off the worksheet and, and sitting with it and completing it. I think it's really interesting. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> So now that we've started thinking about and defining healthy sexuality, I think it's important to know, and kind of the point of this entire presentation, is that sexual health promotion is sexual violence prevention. I think it's also important to know what is our goal when it comes to this. Um, I put this image up here not to say that this is our goal, but because this was in one of the classrooms that I used to teach in when I was a violence prevention educator. Um, and I thought this uh, was really funny and also really harmful. Um, so I thought I'd share it with you all. But I want to ask you again um, for you all to share your thoughts because I don't think it's useful for me to tell you what my goals are um, necessarily. I think it's important for you all, especially being that you work in a different state than I do, um, to identify what some of your goals are when it comes to violence prevention and when it comes to teaching about sex. So if I might ask you again to take 30 seconds to, to share a goal that you have when it comes to violence prevention and when it comes to teaching about sex. So again, talking about consent, so why sexual health and violence prevention are needed. Help people understand that assault happens more than we realize. Mm -hmm. The goal is to promote healthy sexuality. Really want to look critically at the role of ageism, absolutely, and how we usually talk to young people about sex. How can we honor some level of self-determination in these conversations? I love that question, and I appreciate that you're asking about ageism. Um, I feel like even though as a young professional I feel like I experience ageism a lot, I also recognize that I reinforce it a lot, so I think that's something that is really valuable to, to really critically think about. To help change the way society can normalize sexual violence, especially for younger children, absolutely. I don't know if some of you are still typing, but I wanted to, to go back because um, I think I really appreciate that none of you thus far have said the law. <laughs> um, I think the law is really important. It serves a really important purpose in promoting safety, hopefully, in our communities. There's a lot of flaws with the law as well. Um, I think going back to the ageism comment, when you look at um, who is having sex and what we want for folks, again, going back to the consent comment, um, comment as well, is regardless of what the law says, we know the age of consent in Oregon, for example, is 18. Um, we know that the law says that people under the age of 18 cannot legally consent to sexual activity here in Oregon. But we also know that young folks are engaging in sex, and we want that to be consensual. So the law has some shortcomings. I put this little bar here to point out that the law is a low bar. Um, I had a colleague of mine say one time that the goal isn't necessarily that people are just not raping people. The goal is that people are promoting healthy sexuality and honoring their partner's voices and making sure that everything is consensual. If you ask someone, what did you do today? And their answer is, well, I didn't rape someone. It's like, great, that's awesome, but what did you do today? So thinking about the law as a really low bar, especially when we're talking about promoting skills for healthier and safer communities for all people. So I think the law is important, but when we're talking about violence prevention, when we're talking about sexual health promotion, that's so much more expansive than that. I think a good example, I did a presentation um, several months ago for a Planned Parenthood office here in Oregon um, to their educators who wanted me to come in and teach them how to teach consent. 
which I was initially really baffled by the fact that I was going in and, and teaching them about consent. I was like, you're the sexual health experts. Why are you asking me to do this? And I realized kind of in that process, one, that they viewed consent as kind of a violence prevention principle instead of a sexual health promotion principle. Like, everyone deserves to have healthy sex. And instead, they saw it as everyone deserves not to experience sexual violence, which both are true. But when we frame consent as just a tool to stop sexual violence, we're missing the point of consent, I think. Um, and they were struggling because when they were teaching about consent, they always taught about the law. And so rightfully so, all of these teenagers were like, wait, so you're saying I can't have consensual sex or that what if we have sex under the age of 18 when it's just sexual assault? Um, and so the, the definitions that they were using um, and the way that they were talking about it was really reinforcing people not listening to to what they were teaching or what they were promoting. Um, so the law is really important and it, it's designed to help keep people safe. I think it falls short a lot of times um, and there are gaps in it at times. And so when we're looking at what our goal is, looking at what you all responded as far as um, helping people understand the scope um, and pervasiveness of sexual assault, promoting healthy norms, healthy sexuality, thinking about the ways in which we ourselves and broader society are reinforcing violence by through things like ageism and ignoring autonomy and agency when it comes to human beings just, just happen to be young. Um, so thinking about all of these pieces and bringing those together is, is a big goal, but I think that we can do it. So. The next question then is, how do we, um, oh, sorry, jumping ahead. How does healthy sexuality fit into violence prevention? This is one example of how this works, and I think the overlap is really important and critical for you all who are doing violence prevention work in communities. These are shared goals, but they also provide us with some shared language and ways to talk about, I think, sexual health that feel a little less scary for people sometimes. So, um, for example, using accurate information and making thoughtful choices. That is a little different than saying, I want youth to have healthy sex, which I think the S word in general is pretty scary for folks. So, thinking about how we're building shared language and communicating in shared ways is really helpful. Promoting healthy and safe attitudes and beliefs promoting the status of all genders, or all people. Um, and non-consensual sexual behaviors are reduced, right? So sexual assault is reduced. I think finding the overlap and whatever this looks like in your state is a really helpful way to communicate and build buy-in in your communities. So what does it mean to promote? Healthy sexuality, I think this is an important part now that we've recognized that not everyone experiences it in the same way. This means access to comprehensive and medically accurate age-appropriate information for all. I think a key part of this and a key skill is admitting when you don't know something, especially I'm not a medical provider. Um, I have my knowledge about birth control methods, for example, but I also haven't really been formally trained in that. I don't have a medical degree. So recognizing that maybe I'm not the best person to provide medically accurate information about different forms of birth control or pregnancy or um, STIs, STDs, uh, and reaching out, building partnerships with those folks. But also, like, what are the, the websites and resources that are really useful? Um, Jesse mentioned when we were talking a little bit about what the kind of the status of sex ed is in Wisconsin, that there seems to be a big push both in Wisconsin and more broadly nationally to focus health education in particular um, on more skills-based strategies or education strategies. And I think when you're looking at uh, accessing resources just in general, that's a skill that people don't spend a lot of time on, especially in health classes or with young folks. So thinking about that 
piece as well as how are we supporting access to comprehensive and medically accurate information that's age appropriate. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Information on health and gender equity. I think this one tends to be a, um, a struggle for a lot of folks to get buy-in around. Um, I think gender and is fast becoming as scary to folks as the S word sex is. Um, so thinking about this piece that the root causes of violence, when we're taught to value some people less than other people, we're reinforcing the foundations of violence. And so what does it look like if we are excluding certain people because of their identities in our conversations? And I think this is a hard place for a lot of people working in schools, and I don't know if that's true in Wisconsin. I hope not, but I'm assuming it is. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, I do think that this is definitely a struggle for folks at times. Consent is pleasure focused and not fear driven. I think I made the comment when we were in Texas about what if I had named my presentation how to have better orgasms um, and thinking about how many folks would have, would have attended that presentation instead of just teaching good sex a method for violence prevention. Um, and I think part of that is right, like we don't talk about pleasure, we don't talk about orgasms, we don't talk about why people have sex. Um, and so thinking about ways to talk about this and talk about pleasure and talk about what that looks like um, I think is really great and what that can look like. Jesse, you mentioned um, in an email to me that there's, for example, a curriculum that the healthcare education and training or the Department of Public Instruction has partnered with to create and provide training on. And I just looked at it briefly. But there is a lesson, for example, on um, just what do people, what do the young folks want in healthy relationships? What does that look like? And I think that that conversation, although may never explicitly say pleasure, could really focus on like what makes you happy, what gives you joy and pleasure in a relationship. And so, although it's not necessarily sex is pleasurable we're looking at ways that we're enriching our lives and promoting pleasure in our lives in different ways. And I think that was kind of a cool thing to see. I also have looked at a lot of curricula lately who, again, reinforced consent as a violence prevention principle as opposed to a healthy sexuality principle. Um, and curricula that I've heard a lot of really great things about and I was really disappointed to see that in just as you have to have consent, otherwise it's sexual assault, which is absolutely true, but isn't really what consent is about, ultimately. Language to talk about relationships and sex as normal and pleasurable. Um, I just used the example from the, the curriculum that Department of Public Instruction in Wisconsin is using, but I think there's lots of different ways that you all can do this, um, and I think part of that is also modeling behavior. Um, and thinking about how we we talk about sex and sexuality. I started my presentation um, in Texas by asking everyone in the room whether or not um, they liked sex. Well, really, I just said, how many of you like sex? Uh, and I think for the most part, I wasn't wearing my glasses, but I think for the most part, most folks raised their hands. And I was like, that's awesome. Who who doesn't like sex? And folks kind of looked at me, and I, my, I said, well, actually, a lot of people don't like sex for a lot of different reasons, and it's important that when we're having these conversations, we are acknowledging that as normal, that it's not necessarily true that everyone likes sex. Um, and practicing those conversations, practicing how we talk about sex, even if it's with our partners, our coworkers, but of course, conceptually, don't go around asking all your coworkers how they feel about sex. I think that might be considered sexual harassment in some workplaces. But um, having conversations about sex as normal and pleasurable I think is a, a really important skill to practice. And if we ever want young folks to feel comfortable talking about it um, in the broader conversation and accessing those medically accurate resources and asking what medically accurate resources are and asking questions about consent as pleasure focused and not fear driven, um, we also have to practice those skills. 
And then, of course, recognizing that not everyone experiences and expresses sexuality in the same way, and that's okay. Um, I also, in talking with Jesse, talked about um, what did you call it? It was, or what is it called? <laughs> not that you called it, success sequencing as something that's happening in Wisconsin. Um, but the idea that there's a there's a life plan that is successful, um, and then the rest are wrong or unsuccessful, um, and just how limiting that is, especially when I mean when we're talking about sexuality, of course, but like who people get to be, right? If it's reinforcing those those gender roles, those norms, those ideas about who we get to grow up to be, reinforcing the status quo. We will never see innovation or change or growth. Um, I read a good article the other day about how when we don't do things in weird ways, we never change. Um, and so the idea is like, why are we not supporting when folks approach things in unique ways or ask the strange questions? And they use the example, um, well, I say the example like everyone knows it. Um, I just learned about it. So um, an example about how um, scientists are really developing innovative work around uh, space travel by studying geckos and how the formulas we kind of teach in our society aren't like, think about space travel and lizards. They're like, well, how are we going to fix this problem? Um, and few people would maybe draw those connections between lizards and space travel. So thinking of outside the box and recognizing that those boxes really don't apply to, I would argue, anyone, but especially not everyone. So recognizing that we all experience and express sexuality in different ways is really valuable. So what can you do to incorporate that, all that stuff I just talked about into your work. I'm guessing that a lot of you already are, or most of you already are. Um, but I wanted to spend most of this presentation talking about a few strategies that we've enlisted here in, in Oregon that I think have been really helpful. Um, and helpful for me in my practice, even though I don't do direct violence prevention education in classrooms anymore, um, talking with professionals and as I mentioned earlier, we're this multidisciplinary agency. Um, we do all the law enforcement training for folks in the state along with certification for sexual assault nurse examiners. We work with a, a broad, broad swath of folks, and that means how can I promote healthy sexuality and um, sexual health in all the work that we do? Um, so looking at different ways that we can do that is what I really want to focus on today. But really think about your materials. And going back to that age-appropriate, medically accurate resources for all people, a good example I use um, in thinking about advocates who are working in direct service response, uh, do they have materials for kids that come in with their parents? Are there materials on healthy relationships if all they've ever seen is an unhealthy relationship? Are there resources for folks who um, don't fit the dominant narrative around sexual violence? Are there resources for folks who identify as part of the LGBTQ movement? Um, movement sorry. Um, just lost my words. The LGBTQ uh, population. And are there resources in various languages or ways to access those resources that aren't just maybe reading? thinking about different learning levels. So thinking about your materials and what's there and how can you promote healthy sexuality, healthy skills, healthy relationships in those materials, not just focus on what not to do. Thinking about your conversations. How are you talking about things? How are you promoting sexual health and health promotion in your, your general work? And modeling positive behaviors. This is where I center a lot of my efforts. Uh, it felt really disingenuous to come into this work and be talking about these things, talking about what I wanted young folks to do, teaching about bystander intervention, and then not actually doing that in my personal life. Uh, and so really focusing 
every day about how I can model these behaviors. And one example of things I often do is um, think about consent culture and how we incorporate it into our work. So I facilitate a lot of meetings and I'll ask questions and people won't respond. They'll sit there silently or they'll just look at me or they'll avoid eye contact with me. And I often say, your silence doesn't mean yes or no. I need some, some affirmative response here. Um, usually a little more tactfully than I just framed it, but um, thinking about how we're modeling consent culture and if we say, are folks ready to move on and no one responds, that that is not really a response as far as yes, we're ready to move on or yes, we want to do something or we're willing to engage with something. So thinking about consent culture as a, as a good starting place for how we're modeling positive behaviors. So I'm thinking about a few strategies that we can use. One is thinking about um, what kind of frameworks you all have in Wisconsin um, that you are working with. We have, um, fortunately, a very good policy structure here in Oregon to implement sexual health and violence prevention and align that work. Um, but that being said, some of the challenges, like each school gets to decide what they teach, and oftentimes school districts and administrators don't even know what's going on in the classrooms. Um, we also have a lot of schools where it's not a health teacher that's teaching sex ed or violence prevention. In one school in Oregon, I know for sure there's a shop teacher who's responsible for teaching sexual health, which um, I feel would be really entertaining and also really concerning. <laughs> um, but that we have a lot of these same, these same challenges, and we have a, a great policy framework for implementing it. We also have to recognize the, the shortcomings in our systems and how they support providers. So how are teachers getting and school districts getting trained to implement this and deal with fears and the vocal minority in their communities that speak out against sexual health. Um, so I think those, those frameworks are really useful. I know that um, you all have a statute that doesn't require sex education, but it does, if schools do try to choose to implement sex education, um, it, there's the benefit of, of not being limiting within that statute, which is really great. Um, I also saw that some of the language that is used around sexual health is actually human growth and development, um, which I think is really interesting and might actually be really beneficial of that shared language piece, right? Finding ways to talk about this that is really useful and um, gets more people on board. I often say that we want to build and support healthier and safer communities for all people. And I think that that language is often um, easier for folks to get behind instead of we want people to have great orgasms all the time, which is unfortunate. I think people should get behind the orgasms thing. But um, what frameworks are you working with? I went through your, your health education standards, and I think there's a ton in there actually around um, violence prevention and, I mean, less about sexual health promotion, but I think there were um, a lot of really big ones that you could argue absolutely apply. Um, but I love that in kindergarten to second grade, you have identify ways to express needs, wants, and feelings. That is such a foundational skill for being able to communicate consent and to communicate boundaries and to respect boundaries. Um, so I really love that that is starting out in pre-K to second grade for you all. Um, and just looking at the different ways, I also love that you have the words restorative justice in your health education standards. We don't have that, and um, we just updated ours, and now I want to go back in. I'm like, how can we add in restorative justice? I think that is, is phenomenal. And just thinking about that, thinking about that your health education standards include alternative forms of justice that are probably a lot more trauma-informed and a lot more realistic when it comes to thinking about how people engage with trauma and how people engage with dating and sexual violence. 
um, in relationship violence and domestic violence. Um, so I think there's a great opportunity um, to use those health education standards that you all already have, along with the statute that you have um, and any other frameworks that might exist in your state. I also recognize that that push for success sequencing can be challenging. Uh, and I would also argue that there's some shared language there that you can find of wanting to build or support healthy and safe youth again. Um, and that, that looks, I mean, a little bit different for everyone, but there's probably some shared language that you could use to advocate for comprehensive programming on your, your end um, and get some folks to that middle ground. So incorporating this into your practice as well. I talked about and I, I, a broken record here, but modeling behavior. So how do you model healthy boundaries, healthy relationships, and healthy communication in your work? I think that people who work in social justice, violence prevention, violence response, uh, notoriously are really bad at setting boundaries for themselves when it comes to work. Uh, so there are so many folks I know who are just literally on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it seems. Um, and thinking about how when people see that, whether it be your coworkers, whether it be clients, whether it be students, what that means as far as balancing healthy personal life, healthy work life, balancing mental health with physical health, um, and thinking about how we're balancing those things. And also that you all do amazing work and you deserve to be able to relax every now and then. Um, but being able to model that for folks I think is really important. Uh, we do a curriculum review process here and every time I feel like there are things I learn about my own relationships and reading these curricula, uh, and I've had several folks be like, wow, I feel like this is written specifically about my relationship. I need to uh, rethink this a little bit. But thinking about how we are modeling healthy relationships, healthy communication is a huge one, right? Where I would argue that even the most rational person has irrational moments or frustrated moments or like, I'm tired, I can't deal with anything moments. Um, and that's okay. And modeling that that's okay and that you constructively and thoughtfully navigate that and work through that and respond to that when it happens is a really great skill. So thinking about moving towards that, that skills-based education and how we're modeling that. It's okay, we're human beings. We can, we can model making mistakes and how we respond to those and how we hold ourselves accountable. Uh, I think the other piece of this too, right? So not just promoting the healthy, also working to undo the harmful norms and stereotypes in our work. So going back to the comment earlier about ageism, um, how are we reinforcing ageism in our work? For example, if you're doing work with youth, how are you ignoring maybe youth voice in the work that you're doing? How are you incorporating youth voice in the work you're doing? How are you ensuring that when you're advocating for your programs, your um, activities, your efforts, that you're advocating for what youth want and say they need as well? Uh, so I think that this is a really, ageism is a great example. I think um, there are times when, I mean, I say things all the time without thinking, uh, and so thinking about how I learn from those, especially when I'm called out. I am so appreciative of being called out and recognize that that's a lot of work for people to do sometimes. But when we say things that reinforce valuing some people less than other people, those foundations of violence, how do we work to learn from those and build accountability so we're working to undo those harmful norms and stereotypes? So I recognize that's a lot of work, but um, it's so valuable in how we are modeling and how we are practicing this in, in our daily lives, in our work lives, in our personal lives, uh, is so valuable to being able to do this work effectively with young folks and other folks. Which leads me to our next 
piece here, which is open, honest, and authentic conversations. Um, so I think this is, again, that skill we have to practice. So I want, um, usually I would make you talk to somebody. I don't know if any of you are in a room with someone right now. You might be in your offices. But I want you to um, either type in the chat box or turn to someone around you and answer the question, why do people have sex? So I'm going to give you another 30 seconds um, in the question box or the chat box. And I want you to answer, why do people have sex? Scary question. Human nature and pleasure. To feel close to their partner. That's such a sweet answer. Procreation. Absolutely. Making those little humans. Intimacy. Some for pleasure, some to feel connected to someone. <laughs> um, someone said, I love that you're asking this. Did an anonymous question answer with this during an event um, in college? And connection, pleasure, exploration. I love that you said exploration. Totally. Like, I feel like half of sex is figuring out what you enjoy and recognizing that that might change all the time. That also makes it sound really fun. Exploration. Yeah, I feel like I'm on an adventure. Yeah. Any other thoughts for why, why people have sex? Feel free to add them as we go along if there are more reasons that come up for you. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons. Also in response to pressures from partner in society, totally. I think too, going back to that example I, I gave earlier about asking the question, how many of you like sex, being cognizant that sometimes people have sex because they want their partner to be happy. It's not necessarily something they enjoy, but they have consensual sex because it's something that their partner values. Um, I hear that a lot when I've, in my, in my learning about um, asexual population. I love that someone said money. Absolutely. I, I think, um, although we're not necessarily going to spend a ton of time on sex work today, and it sounds like you talked a little bit about pornography um, last week, and that there, um, there are a lot of overlaps in the conversation about pornography and the broader sex work industry. Um, and that that can be a really healthy expression of sex and sexuality for people. It can also be a really, really violent expression of sex and sexuality for people. And handling some of those complexities is, is really challenging. Yeah. So I think this piece of why do people have sex, um, pleasure is a huge part of it. It feels good. Um, some of us, it is, uh, it's part of that, for lack of better words, success sequencing, <laughs> but part of that narrative that we learn in our lives that we grow up and we find a, a partner that we will be monogamous with and we get married and we have kids, um, and that is how we express and love our lives. For other folks, that narrative doesn't work. Um, and people have sex for different reasons. Um, feeling close to someone, feeling intimate with someone, um, learning about yourself, learning about other people, um, that connection, that exploration, um, learning about pleasure, right? Uh, just figuring out what might feel good, what doesn't feel good. I think there's a big movement now. Uh, maybe it's not as big, maybe it's just the all the listservs I have subscribe to it and things, but um, I've heard a lot more conversations lately about, um, one, normal adolescent sexual development um, and thinking in particular about younger kids and when younger kids start experiencing and exploring their body and this kind of push to support them in experiencing pleasure in their body and understanding that 
as opposed to just shaming it and saying don't ever do things and don't ever experience yourself. So I think there's been a, I've noticed a push or a change in some of that. And maybe it also is, is my age and the people around me um, with kids who are starting to, to hit those ages. So I think that open, honest, and authentic conversations, that takes a lot of practice. Um, even for someone like myself, who I think most people would describe me as pretty blunt and pretty honest, all my friends joke that I um, never have a problem sharing my opinion. <laughs> Try to be tactful, but learning more about tact over time. But that open, honest, and authentic conversations, that takes practice. And I think that when I came to this work, it was initially because I didn't have a lot of people that had open, honest, and authentic conversations with me growing up. And so practicing this and um, reinforcing this is really useful. And I think a good example of that is in some of the questions that we get. These are some questions that I got when I was still teaching youth in the classroom. Um, so if someone didn't verbally consent, it's rape. What if both people were drunk? It's a common one I got. If, how physical should a high school relationship be? When is it okay to have sex? Um, if the people are all under the age of 18, is it illegal to have sex? These are complex questions. And I recognize that I'm asking you to hold a lot of complexities here. Um, and I think about, for example, what if both people were drunk? And a lot of times with my colleagues, we've been talking about substance use and sexual violence for a while. And um, people will often talk about this. And I've heard a lot of people have kind of, um, I'm air quoting, like rules around when um, it's OK to have sex after drinking. And, and a lot of folks will say, if you're too drunk to drive a car, you're too drunk to consent to sexual activity. And I just often think about like how disingenuous that is. And I often throw out this made-up statistic that I've created um, that I believe that the vast majority of adults who drink and are also having sex at one point have had sex after drinking and maybe even drunk. And it's been consensual sex. It's been, I really am drunk and my partner's drunk and we both really want to have sex and that's awesome. But how do you hold that complexity with also the challenges that recognizing the correlation between substance use and sexual violence? And so when I'm saying that we need to really practice open, honest, and authentic conversations, it's especially to answer tough questions like this. Um, and so this, uh, someone just asked a question, what if someone is under the influence of alcohol and tells someone that is sober, no? but eventually gives in and just goes along with it. I would call that sexual violence. And I would also say that the person who is sober in particular in that exact scenario um, is clearly not listening to that no. Um, I would say that your no is just as important if you're drunk or if you're sober. And if someone is disregarding your no, that, that's absolutely sexual violence. Um, and again, I, I realize that I just made a very big, like, absolutely sexual violence. And I recognize that people define sexual violence in different ways as well. And so I didn't mean um, to ascribe a specific definition to an experience that maybe some of you have had. And I recognize that some of you might use different definitions for that. Um, when I am teaching young folks, I would definitely categorize that as sexual violence because the skills that I was working to promote are healthy communication. And a lot of curricula, for example, focus on um, giving consent or refusing, but not so much on hearing about it, not so much on what does it feel like to be rejected, what, like how do you process rejection. Um, what does that look like? And so that, that receiving end piece. Um, so and again, there's a lot of complexities here. And I don't think that young folks are incapable of handling those complexities. I think in a lot of ways, adults are the ones incapable of handling those complexities. I think adults are the ones that are like, I need a clear cut answer on what consent is and what isn't 
consent. Um, and it's not that simple because consent looks different for every person. I used to tell my students that um, when you are um, in a, in a longer-term relationship with someone, um, you often get to have conversations about what consent might look like in different ways as opposed to maybe hook up um, with someone where maybe you don't feel as comfortable or vice versa. Maybe you feel way more comfortable in a hook up one night stand, five night stand, whatever um, situation as opposed to um, a long term relationship where the stakes are higher in a lot of ways. So thinking that consent gives us may look different in different situations and that communication is, is really the, the skill to walk away with. Um, I also recognize that sometimes these questions are value questions. I think a lot of parents in particular are really worried about, um, they want to be responsible for values when it comes to people's, um, how they engage with the world, especially when it comes to sex. But as much as parents have a role in promoting healthy sexuality for their youth, schools play a role too. And teachers play a role, too, because we're also responsible for promoting those healthier and safer youth. I mean, that's the entire job of teachers, is preparing youth to be successful and healthy and safe in the world. And so balancing those pieces and recognizing that some values, like when is it okay to have sex, um, there are values that families are going to learn that, or influence people on, there are values that teachers are going to influence people on. And I go back to that sexuality um, and that there are those different levels and we experience and are influenced by different things at different levels and sometimes multiple levels. So when is it okay to have sex? Um, you know, in a perfect world we could say that's different for everyone, but maybe the conversation isn't I need to give you a age down to the minute, it's I want to talk about um, body autonomy and supporting yourself and making healthy decisions for yourself, which is going to look different than age 18 or whatever the law says. <laughs> I'm not sure what the law says in Wisconsin as far as age of consent, but um, that's just one example. I think answering tough questions, having open, honest, and authentic conversations is a part of um, holding a lot of these and navigating a lot of these complexities. So behind every single conversation about consent, for example, we also need to consider, like, why don't people ask for consent? What are those barriers? What are those challenges there? How can the fear of rejection impact someone's ability to communicate about consent? Um, I gave the example in Texas of a lesson in a curriculum called Unequal Partners which um, actually asks people to practice rejecting each other. Um, and I love it. I was just like, yeah, let's reject people and you can be rejected and just practice that skill. And I did that activity or that lesson actually with um, a mixed audience between youth and adults. And I had youth partner with youth and adults partner with adults because I thought it might be a little creepy <laughs> if there were adult youth partnerships there. Um, but we had people actually practice rejecting each other when it came to sex, um, like someone asking uh, someone else if they want to have sex. And uh, all of the youth did it, like they were amazing. They were super respectful. They were super thoughtful. The adults were terrible. The adults were like screaming at each other and like calling each other names. And like it just like went down really downhill really fast for the adults. Um, but being able to practice things like rejection is such an important skill because we're all going to be rejected at some point in our life, hypothetically. I have some suspicions about certain people never being rejected and being terrible people for it. Um, but <laughs> I think rejection is a very normal thing and practicing responding to it is really useful. But that is absolutely going to inform our decisions about not just consent and sex, but things we do in our lives. Um, what makes it hard to say no? What makes it hard to say yes? I think um, as a young person growing up, I was never taught that I got to say yes. My brother has a, um, oh, she turned six today. My niece turned six today. Um, has a six-year-old girl, and um, 
he told me a few years ago that she wasn't going to have sex until she was 18. I was like, oh, that's the worst thing you could have said to me. <laughs> because I was like, you're teaching your daughter that men get to decide who and when she has sex. And that's really problematic. And um, my brother doesn't always like to listen to, to things his younger sister says. Um, but I think slowly he takes things to heart. But thinking about, like, what are those barriers to saying yes? What are those barriers to saying no is an important complexity. And then the other piece, what can we do to make consent more normal? So thinking about consent culture. How are we promoting consent in every aspect of our lives? How are we promoting consent when it comes to um, our meeting culture, our work culture, our classroom culture, uh, even everything down to, uh, I used to use an example um, about like when someone asks you for the last cookie and you really don't want to give them your last cookie, but you're like, I feel like I have to. And so practicing healthy consent around that being like, I really don't want to give you this cookie, but I also want you to have a cookie, so maybe we can split it. Or <laughs> like, you know, um, figuring out how to model and make consent more normal in our daily lives. I also want to go back to that age-appropriate piece again and use consent as an example. Um, so we, as I just mentioned, we just updated our health education standards and we infused consent throughout. Um, but starting early on, it's all about um, personal boundaries. And not just communicating your own personal boundaries, but practicing and learning how to respect the boundaries of other people that are communicated. And how to find out what their boundaries are. So really about boundaries. We don't talk about sex in first grade um, in that context. Um, we do talk about um, sex in terms of procreation. Um, I think a lot of times young folks ask those questions about where babies come from and things like that. And so uh, we infuse some of that in the standards and, and education standards as well. Um, so part of this, and I think part of being age appropriate, is also communicating what is age appropriate to other folks. Um, so when you're talking about doing sexual health promotion or violence prevention education, I think you're going to have people that are nervous or scared because they're not sure what you're going to talk about with um, their kids or youth or whatever. And so being able to communicate what this looks like at, at different ages is really important. Our, um, one of our uh, partners here in Oregon at the Department of Education, he was telling me that a really good measure for what is age appropriate is the type of questions that young folks are asking. So I don't know if you all do question boxes or other exit tickets or things like that, but um, collecting those and having those, um, whether they are typed up or whatever, but having information on what kind of questions you keep getting, asking, getting asked by students um, can be a really valuable tool to revisit um, and to show, like, these are what all the students in sixth grade or seventh grade are asking. And if you documented those over time as well, you could probably show trends between, like, this year we got asked these questions um, at these different times, and then look at it, go back and look at it again the next year and see what what you can compare and show that, that young folks are asking is a good measure of, of age appropriate. But being able to talk about what is age appropriate and in your curricula, in your programming, is I think a really valuable tool for getting some of that buy-in from folks. Another great tool I think is um, positive reframing. So this is infusing Things, um, whether it be in our materials, in our conversations, in our um, education, or our lessons, with health promotion. So um, we do this through positive reframing. So for example, sexual violence is an epidemic in our community and must be stopped. Absolutely true. That's a really important statement. We reframe that in our work to more commonly say, and I said it at the beginning, everyone has a role in promoting healthy sexuality interactions and relationships. 
So going back to that everyone has a role piece, and not everyone's role is the same, but when we are able to reframe some of the things we say, um, I think it's easier for people to get on board sometimes, especially when they find their place in what you're saying. Um, I think the first statement can feel really scary because it doesn't really give us what to do about it. But here, like we have a role in promoting what is healthy. We have a role in ending sexual violence as an epidemic in our communities. So thinking about how we can reframe some of the things we're saying to use health promotion. So I want to give you an exam, uh, a chance to practice this a little bit real quick. But um, a common frame around consent that I often hear is consent is about partners not having to do things that make them uncomfortable. Absolutely true. How could we reframe this to focus on what is positive about consent? So less as a violence prevention principle, more as a sexual health principle. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to a minute to, to think about how you could reframe this um, and practice this, especially since we've talked about consent so much throughout this presentation. So I'm going to give you a chance to practice. How could you reframe this statement about consent to focus on the positive? Consent is about establishing your healthy sexual boundaries. Consent is about communicating your needs and wants with your partner and deciding on ways to best support each other's needs and wants. I love that. That's sweet. Consent means agreeing to something that feels good for you. Consent is about making sure that everyone involved in a situation or relationship feels good about what is happening. Consent is about two partners having shared conversations about what they want, need, and are willing to participate in. Totally. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm getting a lot of communication, a lot of respect, um, a lot about mutuality and equality. Um, I say mutuality, but I also want to acknowledge that not everyone is just with one other person. They might be poly, or they might have um, open relationships, or they might not be in relationships. Consent is about having two partners have shared conversation about what they want, need, and are willing to participate in. Oh, I think I already read that one. Sorry. <laughs> um, consent is about open and honest conversations and listening to your partner. I love that you talk about listening. I often, um, when I was teaching about communication, I would often talk about um, just what is the definition of communication, and people would be like, talking to people. I'm like, yeah, but also <laughs> there's the listening and hearing parts of this, and that's the part we really want to practice, So, or at least in the classes I was in. So the example that we came up with was consent lets people express what they want, like, need, and what gives them pleasure in a relationship. So this is not the only answer. I, I love all of your answers as well. But thinking about how we reframe things and practicing that I think is really valuable. Um, and also lets us, one, I think it feels a lot more interesting to be like, ooh, I get to talk about what I want, like, need, and what gives me pleasure. That's super exciting. Um, as opposed to like, not doing something that makes me uncomfortable. Both are important, um, but when we reframe things, we get to talk about not just what not to do, we get to replace that with what we want people to do and what, what people want to do. Um, so that also gives folks an opportunity to find their, their place in that. This used to say, instead of consent is about partners, um, I think it used to say, um, like, consent is about both partners or two people not having to do things. Um, and the first time I did this presentation, someone in the audience called me out and said that that was really exclusive to monogamous relationships and in a lot of ways very heteronormative. Um, and so just being able to hear that and practice rephrasing it again so that I don't reinforce assumptions about how people are experiencing and expressing their sexuality is really valuable. So we're almost to um, at a time for the presentation and on to, to the questions, if you all have them. But I just wanted to kind of look back over kind of what we talked about and maybe a couple pieces that we didn't talk about but I think are really important. 
Um, so violence is preventable, and that's a really important point. Um, how does this influence what you all are doing? Um, and health promotion is violence prevention. So thinking about how we can infuse health promotion and what that can look like in each unique setting into our work. How can we model this in our work? Um, how can we ensure that we're not just framing things as a way to um, prevent violence, but as also ways to and skills to have healthier, more successful lives without doing success sequencing. Um, <laughs> And oppression is the root cause of violence. So again, when we're taught to value some people less than other people, we're learning the foundations of violence. Um, and it's important to think about that, not only in how this informs the way we talk about violence and approach prevention, but also the way we talk about health promotion. I think it's really important to acknowledge that, um, one, I as a cisgender white straight woman and talking to you about healthy sexuality today and what I've learned about it, but at the same time, I'm a heterosexual cisgender straight, well, I already said that, but <laughs> the straight part, um, white woman, and that my narrative is very different than probably all of your narratives on the webinar today. It's different than um, people who have identities that differ from mine, and I think that's an important piece to acknowledge, especially when you're looking at the sexuality and recognizing that people experience um, sexuality in different ways. And so that's true of your students, that's true of the people in your lives, that's true of the people not in your lives. And so recognizing that oppression is the root cause of violence and we don't want to reinforce that in how we're promoting healthy sexuality. So. Thank you. This is my contact information. If you have any questions as well, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I know Jesse is a great resource as well for the work that you all are doing. So I'm already getting some questions, so I'm just going to jump in. Um, when you're discussing personal boundaries and consent, especially with students, do you have a model for how to do this based on existing interpersonal conflict styles? For example, if I am someone who is uncomfortable being assertive in all aspects of life, is there a way to discuss boundaries that may be more comfortable while still being direct? I think that's a great example. And I mean, if you're looking at, I, I studied communications um, in part in school, and I think that people communicate in different ways. I think a lot of people, when talking about consent, for example, um, reinforce a verbal consent because it feels a lot muddier when you're thinking about the other ways in which people may consent to certain behaviors or certain sexual activities. I think practicing is really important. Um, so whether it's practicing out loud or practicing writing down what boundaries are, but practicing even just articulating boundaries is really valuable. Um, I also think that that's part of whatever your relationship is, is like maybe you communicate largely via text message. I used to tell my students that um, if you can't even say the word sex to the person you want to have sex with, you probably shouldn't be having sex. Um, but I also recognize that because I used to get students also ask me if they're like on the couch um, and like text each other. I'm like if you can't even turn to each other, but I'm also like a verbal communicator and I recognize that that's not true of everyone. So I think that figuring out how you like to communicate, um, maybe you're the type of person who really likes to write letters to your partner, the really long letters that they can read and whatever. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that consent um, can be revoked at any time and also has to be given regularly. Um, so whatever strategies for communication you all come up with, ensuring that both of you understand those and also um, ensuring that you have opportunities to both revoke consent um, and make sure that the person or people who you are engaging with also have that opportunity and that that will be respected. So I, I think we can learn a lot from the BDSM community in particular around consent. Um, and I think a common example is like safe words, but there's a lot of other ways that things are communicated. Um, 
and I think in a lot of ways they've been doing consent a lot better than um, the kind of general dominant culture narrative for quite a while. If that doesn't answer your question, um, please feel free to, to say that didn't answer my question. I'm happy to elaborate more. As a homo flexible woman, is a, I think that's, let's just say in a small community, I have to commend you on the way you, oh, that's not a question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think, uh, I think that I am constantly learning about how to have conversations and how to talk about different things. I feel like I say things regularly and people are like, but also this, and I'm like, oh crap, yeah, I need to consider that as well. Um, so I think that it's constantly learning and that's okay. And part of this process, part of being successful at this is also being able to learn from our mistakes and hold ourselves accountable to what that means. Not just responsible for them, but accountable to, to making change. Are those really the only questions? I feel like I spent all my time answering questions when I did this presentation in Texas. <laughs> you did. I recall that, Megan. <laughs> um, I, I, you've done, I mean, it's a really fabulous presentation, so I'm sure that's part of it. Um, but, Meg, I, I guess I have a question. Um, for folks, for prevention educators who are out there, um, you know, they're trying to find a way to um, integrate, you know, this sort of healthy sexuality into their sexual violence prevention work, um, and they, they're kind of at a beginning point of that. Are there any other resources out there um, or tips that you have for just starting, where to start with that? Yeah, um, I think there are, there's just so many great resources out there. I think one is just like learning about sexuality, um, which includes learning about identities. Um, so as much learning as you can do, I think, is really valuable. Um, and some great resources out there. I think even like spending time swimming through resources that are, are meant for young folks, things like Scarletine and um, Jezebel are, are great resources around sex and sexuality. Um, I think um, I often actually recommend it's pronounced metrosexual, which is where the sexuality came from. Um, but I recently learned that they they did some plagiarizing on the genderbred person, so I'm a little disappointed in that. Um, I also think uh, the Iowa Coalition just came out with a, yes, that's Scarletine. Yep, it's a great resource. Um, the I also think Planned Parenthood has a, uh, really great um, like resources just about sexual health and um, for lots of different folks, their website. Um, I, the Iowa Coalition just came out with, I went to a presentation at NSAC on it, um, a resource called Parents for Prevention. I think it's parentsforprevention.org. Um, but they did a ton of like focus groups and information collecting to try to um, figure out what would be the most useful website for folks. And so they came up, it's a sexual health uh, website for parents, um, but they organized it by age of, I'm air quoting, the kids that, that parents might have. So it goes everything from like pre-kindergarten to elementary school, middle, high school, and then like college and then post-college. So like how to deal with your kids once they're grown-ups and things like that. But um, it's, I think, a pretty phenomenal resource that they created. Um, I also think uh, the Teaching Tolerance website, which is a resource from um, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, but they have uh, an, a blog that they do from teachers on how to address social justice in their classroom. But they also have like webinars and other um, like lesson plans and things that they put out, um, which I think is really valuable in thinking about um, how to ha like hold a lot of complexities in having these conversations. I also highly recommend um, reviewing curricula that are out there, some of those mainstream curricula. 
Uh, we've been doing a curriculum review process here based on our health education standards in Oregon. Um, and I think we just finished our fourth round yesterday, actually. And knowing what, like just reading lesson plans and the different ways that people talk about things, and they're not always great. Like it gives you an opportunity to be like, oh my gosh, I would never do this. But it also gives you good strategies like reading unequal partners and learning about the rejection lesson. Um, and so I think being able to review curricula um, has been really valuable. And there's a lot of free ones like 3Rs is a free curriculum that goes from kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, youth Empowerment Solutions is a um, youth empowerment curriculum out of Michigan. That one is free. Uh, there's a lot of free ones out there, so just looking through lesson plans, I think that's what all of our rape prevention education funded programs um, participate in the curriculum review and then some other prevention programs in Oregon, and so it's been really valuable for them to just learn what different folks are doing. Is that enough resources? Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> it's never enough resources, but... <laughs> Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you so much, Meg. And could you um, just one more time say the one that you said is out of uh, Oregon? Um, there's one I mentioned out of Michigan. Oh, Michigan. Maybe that was it. I was I was trying to Google and find the three R's curriculum, so I think I was only half listening to that part. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, what was that one called out of Michigan? The YES curriculum. It's Youth Empowerment Solutions. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad to hear a lot of these things that um, you've shared uh, or mentioned as resources are things that um, we have talked about in presentations or been sharing on our listservs. So um, that's great. Sounds like we're kind of like on the, on the same wavelength. I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really great ones out there. Um, but yeah, I think learning as much as possible learning what you can. Um, I also would recommend um, signing up for listservs of, um, n especially as a white woman, non-white centric resources. I just um, signed up for one um, called Latino Rebels, um, and they've just they've put out just a ton of great resources, um, which I've learned a lot from. Um, and so anything that can broaden our scope, I think, will make us better violence preventionists and sexual health educators. So please feel free. My, I was just going to say, please feel free. My contact information is here as well. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Awesome. Well, thank you, Meg, so much. It doesn't look like we have any other questions at the moment, but. Um, thank you so much for taking time today to um, do a reprise of your <laughs> NSAC presentation. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to share it with a bunch of other folks who maybe weren't able to make it to NSAC or make it to that presentation. Um, I, I'll say this just for everyone who uh, is on the webinar, Meg is a really great resource. Um, I know that you already know that from having watched this webinar, um, but if you have more questions, you can reach out to her. Um, and also feel free to reach out to me as well, obviously, uh, as the prevention coordinator at Wakasa. But um, resources are everywhere. And I think as long as um, people are connecting with one another, it doesn't matter who it is, as long as we're advancing uh, our, our fields and our work. So um, any, any other last thoughts, Megan? Um, just ensuring that where we are getting our information is medically accurate and appropriate. <laughs> yes. I think we have um, there's a group of folks in Oregon who are pretty active um, against sexual health and sex education. Um, and they have a really snazzy website. Um, and it feels like initially good to look at their website, and then you realize what it is. Um, so I think we have to also be a little cautious on the resources. Um, but if there are great ones that people find, I think those should absolutely be shared. Yes, sorry, I probably should have included that caveat. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's just uh, where we are in Oregon. <laughs> um, 
Can you get a link to the sketchy website? I don't know if I want to promote their website. <laughs> um, I think they exist outside of Oregon as well, their parents' rights in education, um, which I often feel really defensive of when looking at their, their website or their blog. Um, sometimes I've been the direct attack of their blog. So, that I mean, I'm sure that's what fuels the defensiveness. But I think... Um, as well, it's a, it's a good reminder for me that, that parents really want to support their, their young folks and being healthy and safe, and that oftentimes that looks a little different for them, and so finding those common values. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a reminder that parents are invested, even though sometimes I just feel defensive about it. <laughs> sure. Awesome. Well, thank you. Again, um, as I said, folks, um, we will share a lot of these resources that were discussed and the slides and the recording and everything um, uh, probably later this week or next week. So um, thanks, everyone, and thanks again to you, Meg. Thank you all. Yep. Have a great day, everyone.